I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half hour podcast series from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. My guest today is Emily Dye. She's a young woman in her mid-twenties, advisor to GT Communications, but more importantly, been involved with Young Voices, a, a group to help young people write about and defend liberalism. Welcome. Thanks, tell me, Emily. Tell me about Young Voices. Uh, Young Voices is a program that helps young writers um, write their first op-eds and talk about uh, libertarian issues, um, presenting themselves from um, yeah, a libertarian view um, and bringing in more voices into the conversation. Um, and I think that ties well in um, with what I do professionally, uh, which is working in PR. So I'm doing a lot of the work with the media so I can take some of that experience and help young people get their foot in the door um, in the journalism industry. Let's go back a little further. What, what do you, one thing I ask all my guests, because I get so many different answers, because I think liberalism itself is a very diverse social philosophy and phenomenon, what do you take liberalism to be? Liberalism is a focus on the individual, and it's an understanding that I don't know about what's best for you and what's best for your life. Um, only you know that. Uh, we all have our own unique utility curves, as an economist would like to say, like, the thing that makes us happy, happiest and what's best for our own lives. Um, and I think we need to be very careful as a society that we're not dictating for other people what we think is best for their lives. But the, the people you work with, um, tra- train them to write our bids, are they naturally supporting such a thing or is, is, is liberalism quite rare in the upcoming generation? I think the upcoming generation is quite different from some of the previous generations um, and that we are very focused on what's going on in the public sphere mm. and that can lead in multiple directions. It can lead to that more controlling, um, more socialism type view mm. of we're going to fix all the world's problems, um, we're going to fix climate change, we're going to fix all of these things and we're going to do it in a very top-down way. Um, and then there's also the inverse. There's people that are also just as aware but are looking at it from a more liberal perspective. And I think the people that are coming to Young Voices or coming to me or talking to me tend to be more on the more liberal front. Um, They want to see more freedom. Um, They want to be able to live their lives the fullest as they see fit and not have that dictated by previous generations or by governments. Um, Not by previous generations or government. In other words, complete autonomy. Yeah, autonomy, generally speaking, yeah. Are they happy being autonomous? Do they have trust, confidence that they can choose what's best for them? I, I think I know my life and what I need in my life probably better than most people do. Um, I think a lot of people, I, I'm the expert in me, essentially. <laughs> um, no, I don't always make the best decisions. Um, sometimes there are, there are those biases where I think a good one is present bias, where we're more focused on the present um, and we don't think to the future. And I think there are cases where we can be nudging people in the right direction, but a real top-down, strict um, way of ruling is always going to lead to happiness. We, we at the CIS, I think it was two years ago now, did a survey with younger Australians, and uh, we found out that the, that the majority had a positive view of socialism. What do we let make I, sense? I, I think that's I think that's probably pretty accurate. Yeah. I think socialism is incredibly popular right now. A lot of pe- young people are disenfranchised um, with the way things are right now. They feel like they don't have much voice. Uh, they feel that there is this wealthy group that is controlling a lot of things. Um, they see the corruption in society. They see um, large corporations and governments making a lot of decisions, benefiting each other. And there's a lot of angst and anger because of that. Um, I don't think socialism is the answer to those problems. I think it's, in many ways, less government, um, not more government. So you think they're, they're right to see the problems, but they're wrong in thinking the answer is the government should fix it for me. Yes, exactly. I think a lot of the problems are caused by those incentives that are in the government that aren't necessarily beneficial. So we got the lobbying groups and large corporations. There's a very clear incentive Um to do things that benefit the loudest voice, the squeakiest wheel, which is often the person that has the money that can be the squeakiest wheel. Um, And I think we need to take a look at those incentives instead of having this idealistic top down, the government's going to fix it. It's going to make everything better. It's going to make everything equal. Um, 
No, I don't think that's the case. I think we need to empower the people at the bottom, empower people from all um, socioeconomic statuses to right. achieve what's best for them as they view it. Isn't one of the weaknesses or challenge to what you think is that we have to work with others. We, we belong to others. We, we are, we're humans are uh, relational beings. And therefore, to, to get things done, even to find fulfillment in my life, as I'm looking for it, I need to do it not just by myself. Is that not also important in, in your philosophy of life? I think it's very important. Um, I think that's one of the crucial things where government does come in is there are externalities. My What I do does impact others. Um, I can't just, it would make me happy to have a million bucks, but robbing the bank is the way to do it. Um, I think there is a role for government to ensure that my actions aren't harming others. Um, and if I do harm others, then I face the consequences. I, I wasn't just thinking of, of, of government, though that, that's, not, not, that's, that's a good comment that you make, but about, about society, community, family, connections. You talked about liberalism being, I alone know what's good for my life. I'm just, I'm, and I'm, I'm aware that's, that, that's um, I'm just asking you the question, is that too narrow a view of human happiness, do you think? I I do think that there is a very important role for those social dynamics um, and for those I think the family is important. I think it's important to have those close connections, those friends, those family members that do that know you well as you well as well, um, yeah. that can help you strive to be better. Um, and I think it's up to this is where freedom of association comes in. You have, should have a right to choose who it is that you're going to associate with, who you see is helping you in your life, um, striving to be a better person and to achieve the most. To to get on with others, we have to make some limits to ourselves. Self, don't overdo it. Self sacrifice to, to live a purely self focused life. Surely would would mean to live a ultimately unsatisfactory life. You know, I'm definitely not petitioning for a fully self focused life. Um, I think it's yeah. I think social dynamics are part of what make us human. We're probably one of the most social species out there. Um, we need other humans. We need their input in our lives. We need to be able to give and take. Um, I don't think that always needs to be a top-down view of things. And I think there is roles for authority in life. I think parents have an yes. important role to be an authority over parent over their children. Um, I think bosses have an important role of authority over employees. Um, and those are those are authorities that we submit to or that that work. It's not. I think there is a difference between these authorities and a government authority that's making decisions on smaller aspects of your life, like whether you drink sugary soda or not or something. So for you, Emily, Di, the, the, you understand liberalism is primarily focused for individuals and their freedom to associate against a government directive. It's, it's, it's the government, in a sense, is the main opponent, you think, of liberalism in your view of the world. The government or large institutions that yeah, are trying yeah. to have a paternalistic um, role in people. Big lives. government, big business. Yeah. Big education, big. It, it could be, yeah. And I think that it's just a recognition and a humility that an organization that is larger isn't necessarily going to know what's best in the lives of each specific individual. I don't think that they have the capacity for that, you know, for a general sense and can know broadly um, people are generally better off if they're healthy, um, if they're safe. Um, but in the government can't decide whether we're going to talk about health, um, I should or shouldn't be drinking a sugary drink. Maybe having that sugary drink at that moment is a thing that I need for my diabetes or the thing I need to make me happy because I'm struggling with depression. I just need to get through the day. It, the government doesn't know each individual circumstance. Um, it, it's a common defense of liberalism is the fact of knowledge is, is, is limited. I think this is Hayek's great point that uh, knowledge needs to be spread out in society and no, you can't have it at one place. And that's why human decisions and things like the even even the price index means that knowledge is diffuse. I think that's quite helpful. But to stay with your health example, Emily, are there not situations where human be where many people are ignorant of what's best for them? And that may not matter about what TV show I watch. I'm just wasting my time. But with my health, it could be very serious. So is there not a need for government paternalism, as I think that's the word, in matters where I can do harm to myself? By ignorance, I'm thinking here of anti-smoking laws, of seatbelt laws, of anti-sugary drink laws, <laughs> if there are such things. What, 
we, 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 how do you understand the role of government in paternalism for our own health where we otherwise may be ignorant? I think in most cases, the government needs to take a step back. Um, I think we tend to lean towards more, well, this is better. This is obviously better um, when we don't necessarily know the, gen- know the circumstances. Um, it, it is one of those issues where you need to be careful. Like seatbelt laws, I do think, play an important role. But that also isn't just something that affects you. So you're not wearing your seatbelt and you get in a car crash and you die. But same with same with who I smoke. That's true. Um, would, would you go that? Would you say that? Because in this country, you know, there are quite draconian laws about advertising and smoking. Yeah. And they're, apparently, the they're, smoking is declining at last um, in our country. Would would that be a justifiable use of government paternalism in your view? I think for the smoking issue, the amount of paternalism, particularly with the taxes, the heavy taxes on smoking, has had its own externalities in many ways. Um, we better explain externalities. You use the phrase externalities. You mean uh, the, the harm that is like the unexpected harm, essentially, right. with any given action. So you intend to be doing good, or you're, um, and it's causing harm to others. It's causing harm to, um, to society more broadly. Um, well, with, with smoking, you've got a case where we have very draconian smoking laws in Australia. And now we have a very large black market for cigarettes. I think that's a huge problem. We've caused, like, with, we're trying to fix one problem. We're causing another problem. I think that reducing reducing the tax would probably be a good thing. It would help families of addicts um, have more disposable income for other things, not just cigarettes. Okay, can I push, push, just push this a little further? What about the, the, the uh, forbidding the taking of many other drugs? You... There are many drugs, which there's a whole industry both trying to stop drug taking and no doubt black market trying to provide drugs, narcotics and so forth, and amphetamines. And does, does your liberalism say that really is, is a mistake? The war on drugs is a mistake? Oh, I think the war on ju- drugs is one of the worst mistakes that we've seen and one, one of the top mistakes in the 21st century, uh, 20th and 21st century. Um, we've seen huge cost of life. Uh, we have, I forget how many people in the United States are imprisoned have lost years and years of their life from marijuana charges. These are these are huge issues, and that is, I think, that is the example where paternalism really does fall short. We are causing more harm by the restrictions than we would by allowing people that more freedom, um, even if it is freedom that we see to harm them. So the harm is in the is in the people being caught and put in jail. That's a harm. That's one in, in harm. Your view. Other harms too. Other harms are the cartels. We've created a giant illegal market that's incredibly dangerous. Yep. You have people that get murdered over drugs regularly. The, these giant businesses, they are businesses in a sense, who don't have a legal system to protect their assets, have resorted to other more dangerous means. Um, and that's deadly force in many cases. I'll come back. It's a good point you make. One of the necessities for a good liberal society is few, maybe few, but strong institutions and laws like the protection of property, proper banking system, uh, rule of law, crucial rule of law. And I guess when you go to the outlaw world, you see a kind of liberalism <laughs> of, but based on violence and intimidation rather than institution. Yeah. And, and, and you believe that, in fact, we'd be better off if we made heroin and amphetamines and all these things ice legal. I, I actually do, yeah. Uh, I think that a lot of these addictions, these drugs, they're very different, d- very dangerous, very deadly. I don't think anyone should be doing ice. That said, people do do ice. <laughs> um, that hasn't changed. I think those people need help. I think it, you see drag addicts, I think that's a tragedy. That's mm. not something that we should be punishing. It's someone we should be helping. The liberal makes a distinction between what should be illegal and what is unethical or immoral. That's a crucial distinction we, we, that, that you make. So you, you're saying you, you believe drug taking is bad for people. Making it illegal is not going to help. Is, is not good. That's your. Is there an example where this has been tried? And, I mean, it's a trouble with these trying experiments. You can't run two societies next to each other, yeah. different laws, and compare. But is there anywhere where you've seen your your beliefs vindicated empirically? Somewhere where there've been lower drug laws and where the the society has been a healthy society than what you've seen both here and in the United States? I think a good example would be um, well, Amsterdam is the thought that comes to my mind with um, marijuana. 
I think that they have benefited quite a bit by having such a liberal view mm-hmm. on these drugs that aren't that we you know aren't that harmful to society. Um, they aren't imprisoning people, obviously, for marijuana times. They actually have a great tourism industry around it. Um, and I don't see really any detriment that's coming out of it for that society as a result. I could keep asking about limits. I mean, you're not saying there, can, there can't be limits. You're, you're thinking that on the whole we draw the line too, in a too, too strongly paternalistic way when you, you think a freer society is a better society. What about, what about in inequality? One of the, one of the issues that marks our, our uh, mark of liberal societies by its very nature. Some will get further ahead than others, either by fair means or f- by non-fair means. Some are born in, into contexts where they've got a head start, others without. Should should anything be done about, about inequality or should that just be allowed just to be? I mean, it's going to be yes and no. Um, I think a lot of times there's inequality that is caused by the institutions, by the strict regulations, by overburdensome laws in the case, I think a good case is the corporate welfare. We're giving a lot of money to very large companies and expanding inequality in a sense, because we're going to give a tax break to Amazon. We're going to give a tax break to Google because they're going to come to our city. It's going to increase employment. It's going to be great. But that makes it harder for the little guys. We create burdens and regulations that are very complicated and very difficult for a new business to come into the market and start operating because it's just a huge stack. It's a huge cost that's up front in order to like manage to get through that regulation and start a business. There's a lot of boxes that need checked. And so that benefits the bigger company and hurts the smaller company. And so these people that are trying to make it for themselves aren't able to, well, that's where you, that's where government regulation decreases competition. Yeah. And increases inequality. We also here have, you know, uh, organisations which try and increase, increase competition to try and prevent the predatory behaviour by some companies over others. The ACCC that does that here in Australia. I think there is a role for that. I think there's a role for anti-competitive yeah. behaviour, stopping anti-competitive behaviour, yes. I was, when I was in inequality, I wasn't thinking, but you, what the, the interesting issue you raised about commercial inequality, business inequality, I was thinking of more human inequality of uh, capacities and abilities. Um, our tax system ta- is, is progressive. It, it taxes some people and gives money to other people. It's, 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 not, it's not equality in one sense, but is it another? Does, what, what does liberalism say about that? Does liberalism think that's a good idea or does it think really a more classical laissez-faire me- me- method should be dealt with, should be allowed to preserve? Well, first I'm going to push back. I don't think our tax system is particularly progressive in Australia at least. Um, in that we do have um, very high taxes on income and um, corporations, but we have also a taxes like the cigarette tax that we were discussing earlier, like the alcohol tax, that are very high and they're not based on income. No, they, and yeah. we do know that people in lower co- incomes tend to smoke more. They tend to drink more. They tend to Is have- that right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, as a percentage of their income as well. So it's a large, yeah, as a percentage of their income, they are drinking right. more, essentially. Why, why are you a liberal? Now, I see you're, you're a liberal. I put you in my, in my spectrum on the more libertarian end of liberalism. That I've had people, conservative liberals, you're on the more libertarians. Why, why are, what's convinced you that this is right? Can you think of anything that's happened that you've noticed and seen, or is it just, just came to the idea and thought it was naturally the case? <laughs> Well, I, I definitely started out more conservative, so I have moved quite a bit to the left over my lifetime, which I think is the opposite for a lot of people, where they start out um, to the more left. on the left and then move to become more conservative. See, this 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 this, 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 this is the confusion. Um, left and right are often seen as left is socialist, right right is seen to be more liberal. So it depends how you're putting it. You move from conservative yes. to more libertarian. Yes. Approach. Why was that? I think it was a little bit of gaining that experience, seeing people living different lives than what I had lived um, and realizing that their lives are great. <laughs> I mean, or they or they view their lives as great. Um, so it was more exposure in one sense. I started out um, very um, anti-gay marriage. I grew up in a very strict religious home. So I bought into that ideology. And then I make, met people who were gay and lesbian, totally changed my perspective. I was like, oh, and so those kinds of issues have moved me. Um, yeah. In fact, do you think that's one of the key, key forces here, that uh, pl- pluralism, in effect, 
perceived pluralism, meeting other people of different different perspective, different outlooks, that made you realise that there may not be, it might not be best to have one rule for everybody, but let many people do different things. It was the experience of pluralism that gave you that view. Yes, exactly. It's, I was speaking with Emily Dye, who, um, as well as being advisor to GTCom, has been involved in an organisation organization called Young Voices, which helps to enable young people to publish and write defending liberalism, and particularly of the more libertarian kind. One of the great challenges to, to liberalism today, I think, is the, the growth of what, uh, as, some, as, as woke culture, that's a very inexact term, but there's been a great concern to prevent people being harmed, a, a tremendous concern about harm. In the name of preventing harm, uh, there's people have been, people have been deplatformed, rules have been passed on what you can say and do, deep concern about having uh, quotas for, for uh, diversity and all this. Do you see that as an issue? I see it as a huge issue. I think the woke culture and wokeism, it is an evidence base. We're not looking at whether quotas actually improve a woman's outlook and like improve her ability to go up, move up in the workplace. Um, in many cases, that doesn't happen where you put a quota in and everyone then doubts whether that woman deserves to be there. The same with um, people of minorities. You then doubt, oh, do they, do they really deserve it? Or were they, do they just get that slot at that university because they're black? Which undermines that student and means that they're continually having to fight against this view that they don't deserve to be there. So that's just one example of where you can't question. You can't say, no, um, I don't actually think quotas work. I don't think that's actually achieving what you want because quotas are a part of this woke agenda. What about the, the, the concern for racism, for homophobia, transphobia is now one very hot issue. Uh, there's a great deal, great deal of concern for minorities perceived to be in some sense as oppressed minorities and the desire to make life better for them has led to a whole a whole new way of understanding society, which is, which is contrary to a the one you put forward of, yeah. of, of one in which freedom is, is uh, prized. Okay. Now, these are, it's often your generation, if I may be so bold. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, I, I will say that, talk, too. Uh, an old baby of is in danger when he talks about generation. It's your generation. Now, firstly, what's going on? Do you, do you understand what's going on and why it's happening at all? Or, or is, is, it, is it a puzzle to you? It, in a sense, it's almost taken with a religious fervor. You've got this whole group of heresies, essentially, that you can't yep. say this, you can't question this. And I, I view that as incredibly problematic in society. It means that we can't fix issues of I mean, systemic racism, to use a woke word, since we can't look at the education system and say, oh, why is there, why is there this issue in the, the United States I'm pretty familiar with, where you've got like the poor black schools? Well, why is that? Well, it's just racism. Instead of talking about, well, why are these neighborhoods set up this way. Oh, we don't have the ability for students to be able to move across neighborhoods. It's based on housing prices. And actually looking at the deeper issues and figuring out the why, it's, it's just racism. So you, you you believe, in fact, the calling of racism may be actually statistically unhelpful in helping the disadvantaged in many cases. Yeah, in many cases. And it, it feels good to just say, oh, that's racism and be all proud of yourself for combating racism and combating these words and create, combating terminology. Uh, instead of actually looking, taking the time to ask the hard questions, um, make harder decisions, um, we're going it, to, often it's just like, it's the gut reaction that we're going with. And it's it's not rational. It's not helpful to the conversation. Now, you, grew, you grew up in the United States? Yes. How, 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 when did you move? I moved about three years ago. Right. So you've got a very fresh view of, the, of it. And you were there for Trump, which I'll come back to in just a moment. <laughs> What's different about Australia on these issues of liberalism? Have you detected a different way in which the two societies work? I'd actually um, say that Australia is more liberal in many ways than the US. Yes. Uh, the US is broken down into a very divided, very there's a lot, of, a lot of shouting back and forth at each other and a lot of talking past each other in the United States and not a lot of actually having a conversation. Um, and I think Australia's done a better job about, about having more rational conversations, we're more center. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the voting system, has a lot to do with... The voting system? Yeah. Uh, compulsory voting? Compulsory think? voting, I think, has had an impact. Um, I think also um, preferential voting has had a huge impact. 
it's not going to be the loudest or most radical. It's not going to be the Trumps. It's not going to be the Bernie Sanders um, that are going to get people's attention. It's going to be the middle of the road guy. It's going to be the ScoMo. Less interesting, but... Uh, <laughs> less interesting, less exciting, but also less radical. I, I wonder also, uh, um, this is my amount of history, the United States was founded idealistically in many places, many places, certainly the early 13 colonies, the Puritans, a light on, the light on the hill. There's a kind of idealism in America, which I don't think Australians have. I mean, much more, much more should be right. Uh, maybe I'm over, oversimplifying. Yeah. But I see that, pu- that Puritan, and I'm not using the word critically, just objectively, cr- idealism still, still thrives without religion anymore, without, so without God, I should say. Mm-hmm. In your comments about the woke culture, yeah, you said it feels like religion. I, I would say that the United States is in a battle of two religions. It's almost, in a sense, you've got the classic traditional conservatism that's taken it to a different level. I think Christianity in the United States is very different than Christianity in Australia. Australian Christians are much more willing to accept others, be more let live, live and let live. Yes. They're more willing to accept the differences um, and live their lives as they see fit and they see as being the most moral life for them. And they're less wanting to make those moralities law. I think in the U.S. we've got a system of we've got actual people in the U.S. that are petitioning to have adulterers stoned. Like that's a view that I have heard (laughs) argued in the United States. So we've got that side of things that very extreme. And then you've got the same very extreme woke culture that has its own Heresy yep. doctrines. Are you are you hopeful? Um, you've taken on this this campaign to actually help pro- propagate liberal and libertarian ideas. It's in the next fifty years. Do you think it'll get better or worse? I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> when you're as old as I am, um, are you confident, or, or do you think it's going to be a, a very difficult a very difficult future for for, for liberalism? I, I'm optimistic. I think in general as a society, we, we get more moral over time, I think. Um, a lot of issues that we, we get, were... We say it again. We get I more moral. I think we've gotten more moral over time as societies. I, slavery is a good example. I think gay marriage is another good example of we've moved towards more liberalism, towards a more pluralistic view. We've got more exposure to other people from different backgrounds, and we're more willing to be okay with that. So you you believe in human progress? Yes, I do. And I think, it, and, and not only on the moral sense, I think on the like financial sense, on, the, on sense, on the health sense, on um, education. We've gotten more educated. People are staying in school longer. Um, more people are literate than they used to be. Uh, math skills may need some work, but I think they are ultimately improving. We've got more. Th- more stuff, in a sense, we've got. Um, You're not worried about the forces of reaction, both popular reaction from the left and the right, the uh, extremes. You mentioned the stream in your the country of your birth, and in the world today, or, 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 autocracy and authority and government seem, in the short term, to be doing well. Um, there's concern about the kind of issues we're talking about. Make young people think that socialism is an answer. Uh, the concerns about inequality and uh, institutional working. You don't take these as serious threats to your belief that we are getting better? I do see them as serious threats. Um, I am a bit of a Pollyanna and a bit optimistic (laughs) as a general sense. (laughs) Um, But I do think that we are ultimately getting better and I do have a lot of faith in humanity. I do have, I I believe that we, we will strive for better answers. I think people, people want to see themselves as good and I think a continual pursuit of truth. What's what's your faith in humanity based on? What uh, what? Why do you have faith in humanity? <laughs> Again, a bit of a Pollyanna, but I think in general, most people they they want to do good in society. They want their lives to have meaning. Um, they want to provide value. I think that's a very human thing, and with that, that comes a lot of good and a lot of striving to do better, a lot of learning, um, a lot of growth. It does seem to me that in many of its various forms, liberalism does require a certain trust and some distrust too, distrust of, of centralised power, and but a trust in human beings' ability to do well left not you know, their own devices in some form. And I see that you have a strong sense of trust in human beings' 
I would, I'd love to come back in uh, 50 years' time and have another, do this interview again <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and see whether... I like people. I think, I think people are whether, great. Whether, uh, uh, whether that trust has been um, vindicated. My own feeling about it is that short-term, there are often reasons to be quite pessimistic. Yeah. Uh, last century, the, the two terrible wars uh, and so forth. And in this century, there are many things. But I do see a kind of a long arc that, that does make maybe suggest you might be right about a, 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 a better a, a movement in certain areas. Although not on everyone do we even agree what does count as a good moral outcome. Do we? That, that is true. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's where liberalism is, is important yes, because li- my yes. morals are probably somewhat or yes, why these morals It different. tries as far as – it tries to a certain extent to, to leave some, the big issues in life not to be the decision of the top down, but of individuals and, and individual groups with the freedom to do it. Thank you very much, Emily, for talking with us. It's been great. That's uh, Emily Dye, who's involved particularly in helping young, young voices speak for and defend liberalism, a, a lover of people and a lover of wisdom and a lover of freedom. This has been another podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been an independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Head to cis.org.au to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.